My name is Michael Reynolds. I'm the editor-in-chief of Europa Editions, uh, the publisher of this book here, Atlantis, A Journey in Search of Beauty, uh, the book that we are here to, to celebrate um, with this extraordinary conversation between uh, Renzo Piano, Carlo Piano, Will Schrut, and uh, Michael Kimmelman. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome those of you who have joined us for this event. Uh, there are over 400 RSVPs, 500 RSVPs, I believe, from, for this event from all over the world. And uh, I especially want to thank our partners on this event. First of all, the wonderful Ivy Bookshop in Baltimore in Maryland. You'll see uh, a link to the Ivy Bookshop pop up in the chat box um, at some point during this event. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank the equally wonderful bookshop.co.uk. Um, if you're joining us from the UK and you don't yet have a copy of Atlantis, you can find uh, Atlantis uh, and order it from bookshop.co.uk uh, at a link that will also be sent to you via the chat. Um, and I'd especially like to thank the Itali Italian Institutes of Culture in uh, London, Dublin, Washington DC, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and New York for partnering with us on this event. Um, it strikes me that Atlantis is, is at times less of a, a book and more of a, a conjuring of some sort, a conjuring uh, by father and son of an ideal voyage of ideal physical spaces, a conjuring in a sense of, of perfect forms, of perfect communities and societies that are contrasted, of course, um, with the always less than perfect um, realities of place and form, relationships and societies. Um, and it's in this sort of tensile zone between perfection and imperfection that this book, um, the conjuring behind this book succeeds, I think, like uh, architecture and, and art, Atlantis describes um, in many ways the commingling of past, present, and future. And, and it's a very, very clever and, and, and moving, I think, rumination both on belonging and rootedness and at the same time transcendence and, and departure. Um, I read recently a, a, a wonderful review that was published in Bucanista of. Uh, of Atlantis by the critic Mika Provata Catalone, um, who wrote or described Atlantis as audaciously ambitious, unfailingly beguiling, intimate and deliberately public all at once, vigorously peripatetic, languidly philosophical, a complex offspring of the tradition of ancient travel logs of ignorance and knowledge after the model of Herodotus and Ptolemy. Um, and this quote, I think, gets at sort of that tension, at that, that, that dialectic, that exchange between knowledge and ignorance, between perfection and imperfection. Um, hello. Yes, hello. Are you uh, <laughs> can you see me? Uh, we can see you yeah. indeed. Oh, you indeed. my God. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Not easy, not easy. Not easy. Okay. <laughs> So now I can say, now I can say we are joined um, today for what hey, I'm, sure a lot, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure will be an inspiring conversation on beauty and architecture, um, on modernity, on cities by Renzo Piano, um, co-author of Atlantis. And for anyone who knows anything, I think, about modern architecture, a man who needs very little introduction. We're also joined by his son, Carlo Piano, a journalist and uh, the other co-author of Atlantis, and by Michael Kimmelman, author and a New York Times architecture critic, who, uh, whose most recent piece I, I just read before this event um, is a beautiful piece on uh, Chinatown, and I just learned is going to be one of the pieces that will be brought together to, to form a book uh, to be published very soon. Um, and then finally, we're also joined by poet and the translator of Atlantis, Will Schutt. Um, I want to remain, re remind everyone that um, while uh, our speakers are visible and audible, and the only uh, people on this call who are audible, 
Um, you can ask questions uh, if you would like using the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll try to incorporate them in the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, uh, I would like to invite Carlo Piano, um, who will read a little passage from Atlantis in Italian, and Will Schutt, who will read that same passage from his translation into English to give us a little taste of Atlantis. Per prima cosa, devi stare fermo sulla battigia, al limite della spiaggia, e osservare quanto l'onda sale e quanto scende. Il rapporto del castello di sabbia con il mare è più importante di quanto appaia. Studia bene le onde, una dopo l'altra. Quindi decidi dove posizionare il castello, ma attento. Se è troppo vicino all'acqua, verrà subito distrutto. Se è troppo lontano, non potrà giocare con le onde. Bisogna anche capire se l'onda sta salendo o scendendo. Suona complicato, ma è semplice e intuitivo. Poi si deve scavare con le mani un piccolo fossato, ma stando attenti. Va fatto dove la sabbia è inumidita e poi bisogna ammassarla e lavorarla fino a creare la base del castello, che è una specie di montagnola, con un'inclinazione ideale di 45 gradi. Non serve che il fossato sia più profondo di 30 centimetri e largo più di 45. Il castello, invece, dovrebbe essere alto 60. Dopo, devi cercare un ingresso nel canale per lasciare entrare l'acqua. Il momento magico e quando le onde iniziano a penetrare e allagano il fossato. Se il castello è in buona posizione, puoi guardare l'acqua fluire. Allora, per catturare l'immagine nella tua memoria, chiudi gli occhi quando entra l'acqua. Svelto, prima che se ne vada. Devi catturare l'istante. La retina scatta una fotografia. A questo punto, metti sul castello una piccola bandiera o qualsiasi cosa trovi, per renderlo visibile alla gente che passeggia. Vai a casa e non voltarti. Non bisogna girarsi, perché il castello è destinato a scomparire, sarebbe soltanto una delusione veder vederlo sfaldarsi. Meglio serbarne il ricordo. I should say, I don't know if you mentioned this, Michael, but obviously this is co-authored and the... Um... Uh, Renzo and Carlo are alternating passages back and forth. So I will, because I am neither Carlo nor Renzo, just pretending to be, um, um, I'll signal when Carlo is speaking and when Renzo, and at the beginning this is Renzo. Yeah. The first yeah. thing you must do is stand on the shoreline at the edge of the beach and observe the rise and fall of the surf. The relationship between the sandcastle and the sea is more important than it appears. Study the waves closely, one by one, then decide where to build the castle. But be careful. Too close and the water will immediately destroy it. Too far and the castle won't play with the waves. It sounds complicated, but it's actually simple and intuitive. Next, dig a shallow moat with your hands, but be mindful to dig where the sand is damp. Make a pile and sculpt it until you form the base of the castle. Like a hill, ideally, it should sit on a 45 degree slope. The moat need be no deeper than 30 centimeters and no wider than 45 centimeters, whereas the castle should be 60 centimeters tall. Still red, so. Uh, afterward, dig an opening in the moat to let the water in. The moment the waves first enter and flood the moat is magical. If the castle is in a good spot, you can watch the water run its course. Then, you store the image in your memory. Close your eyes as the water arrives quickly before it slips away. You have to freeze the moment. Your retina snaps a photograph. Then top the castle with a small flag or whatever is lying around so that it will be visible to people walking by. Turn home and don't look back. This is Carlo. 
Don't turn around because the castle is bound to disappear and to see it crumble would only bring disappointment. You're better off preserving the memory. <laughs> really good. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Michael Kim, I'm, I'm going to turn things over to you. Uh, and thank you again for joining us and I'll see you at the end of the show, let's say. So, um, um, Will and, and Carlo and Renzo, um, uh, hi, I'm uh, glad to be doing this. It's a very beautiful book. And um, so I wanna first thank you because um, it's such an interesting project. Uh, in fact, what we're doing here makes me think a little um, of a little Borges labyrinth because in fact, the, the, the book is a kind of interview, Carlo, of you and of your father but also of your relationship. And now I'm interviewing the two of you about an interview that you did. Um, and so it's very interesting um, to have the two of you as authors. And I wanna explore a little bit how you both talk, thought about this book. Um, but first, let me ask uh, the obvious question. So um, did, you, did you find Atlantis? <laughs> I guess you'll talk to me, Michael. Huh? Sure. Right, so. Okay. Well, well, no, no, no. <laughs> I, did, I didn't find. I didn't find. But you know, Michael, uh, everybody looked for Atlantis. Everybody has in his mind Atlantis. I don't know one single person that doesn't have Atlantis in mind. You have Atlantis, of course. I guess for you, Atlantis is writing, is society, is education, is music, playing piano. Atlantis is a, is, a, is a beauty, it's beauty, it's the dream, of, it's a spiritual, it's something. Life is not just about needs, uh, it's also about desires, dreams, aspiration. So everybody is Atlantis at its own level. And so inevitably you look for, for Atlantis. But at the same time, I don't think that Atlantis doesn't exist. I think it does exist somewhere must be somewhere. I'm still looking for Atlantis, by the way. <laughs> but well, you don't find, but I never found it. You get very close. Atlantis is some way, you can talk, think about Atlantis like, like beauty, in, in the noble sense of the word, not, not, uh, not in the sense of a frivolous sense of beauty, in the real sense of beauty. That may be Atlantis. But as you know, beauty is impossible to reach. When, when you try to get the beauty of perfection, you realize your arm is too short. You, you don't get it. So this, this I, I, I think, but, but it was inevitable to go around the world with my son. It was inevitable in some way. And um, no, I didn't find Atlantis. <laughs> well, we will get to this question. You end, the book ends, I don't think this is a spoiler. The book ends with you on your way to Ithaca and talking about beauty and uh, relating it to Atlantis. The, the Greek word is kalokogathia, yeah? That you, yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for, for you, Carl, and I want to get back and explain to people what we're talking about because we're leaving out what this book actually is. It's literally a boat trip that the two of you take and you don't yeah. explain yeah. something, so I want to Yes, I want I, to explain I, them to me too. But Carlo, for what, just before we get to the brass tacks of how this book came about and what you do on it, tell me what this book was for you. Because yeah. it's an interesting <laughs> project to do this with your dad. Um, okay. Allora, I answer in Italian because in English it's too difficult to make. And Will can translate. No. Thank no, you. No, <laughs> no. no but wait a second, Carlo. You must know that Michael, Michael Kimmel, talks Please. Italian. He's in love with Italy. He has a house in Tuscany. So you, I think Michael will understand. Anyway. Leave me out of this. <laughs> okay. Quest <laughs> this book, questo, questo libro, per me, rappresenta una vendetta. Vende revenge, no? Perché mio padre, quando eravamo ragazzi, quando eravamo dei boi, nella, nella Repubblica di Genova, nella Repubblica, antica Repubblica di Genova, c'erano due tipi di, di ingaggio, diciamo, per, per i marinai, no? Quello con diritto di mugugno, che significa 
che tu ti puoi lamentare e ti pagavano meno e quello invece con diritto di, senza diritto di bugugno ti pagavano di più, more money, ma non ti potevi lamentare. Ecco lui, noi non avevamo né lo stipendio né il diritto di mugugno. The Mugugno, I could paraphrase this, but it was though Carlo was saying that this was a vendetta against his father, who, when he was a child, would take him uh, out on boat trips, and they were not allowed to uh, to uh, touch the ground, to 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 come ashore, uh, which for a child uh, is something you you want to spend your summer. I think Carlo mentioned wanting to eat pizza and, and seeing friends and his father would not let him uh, land the boat nor, um, nor were they allowed to complain. Um, yeah. I, the, I, yeah, I think that was... But yes, this, e, e questo libro, this book, è stata l'occasione per vendicarmi, per averlo bloccato sulla barca, on the boat, Per, per un lungo tempo poterlo interrogare e poter capire i suoi segreti e fugare nei cassetti. Hai capito? Sì. This is for me this book. Right. <laughs> so, it, so let me ask you, since you say it was a long time, let, first so, let's do some basic things. So this is a book about a trip the two of you took on a boat sì. that was, um, I, it, you, you you say that an admirable, an admiral, I'm sorry, an Italian admiral asked or invited you to take this trip to do sort of hydrographic uh, studies, but it really is uh, an occasion for you to spend time with each other and for you, Renzo, to explore projects that you have done all around the world. So you're in Japan and New Caledonia, you're in San Francisco, in New York, uh, London, you take a barge, up to Paris to go back to Beaubourg. And, and you have a wonderful thing in the book, which, um, which I thought was sweet. You, you're not the only two voices. Your, your mother, Carlo, also writes you a letter, which you save to read. And, uh, and it's very sweet. So partly the book is about, um, Renzo, you thinking about your buildings, and Carlo, you occasionally criticizing his buildings, which I think is also wonderful. But, but it's also about father and son, which is really interesting. So I'm going to only talk for one more second to ask you, when did you make this trip? How long did it take? And did you, Renzo, did you just disappear from the world for a year or so to do this? Well, good question. Uh, I have so many things to say. First, uh, I think Carlo enjoyed this because he was able to torture me. And, and so, and uh, it was good for me because I was uh, able to to go through what I call slowness. You know, the, the water is about slowness. You know very well what I'm talking about. This is about a, a different time running. You know, it's a kind of you take time. You so you are in the position where if you have to confess something, you do it. Well, in reality, this uh, this trip was really made, not all together, uh, but it, it was made. Apart that, um, um, I already put on the boat my my children, four of them, when they were um, very young. Carlo was born in uh, February, and he came to the boat one in July, so he was what uh, five months. Everybody, so everybody spent between you know one year up to fifteen year when they started to to start a rebellion. For fifteen years, they've been spending one month, so that makes fifteen months. That makes almost one and a half year. But also, of course, we went around with the, to the water to on the boat. Carlo actually went on the on the. On, on that uh, um, oceani oceanographic boat. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a, somewhere between uh, an invention and a reality. Right, like so, it lands. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but it's, it's real, it's real. Yeah. And um, so, and you know what happened? Is that the certain moment in your life, you, you've done so many things so many things it's incredible if you don't if you never stop 
you do so many things. But the right one, really the right one, you have not done yet. Mm. That's a pro real problem. Well, the, you, know, the, you know very well. The this metaphor, is a plan. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was going to say the metaphor of the book is this search. It's a search for beauty. Uh, yeah, exactly, beauty. exactly. In some ways, I said. So I need to do this because your son is probably the only guy that can can look in in the drawer, can find the documents. Is a kind of uh, of witness uh, yeah. the, because he was there all the time. So he knows, and he also don't accept to answer to somebody else if it's not your son. Uh, so uh, you confess without really confessing. I mean, just trying to, and the, the most important thing that you have to confess yourself that the right, the right thing you have not done yet. Mm. You know, and it's uh, you have done so many things. Sometimes, sometimes, quite close to what you like, but there's always something missing. You know very well. You know yeah. very well. You are a writer. You are, you, you are a creator. I mean, you, sometimes you get close, but you never get there. You never yeah. get to the center of things. And this is what torture you. That's the torture. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and so I, and what keeps you in life? I'm 83 years old, you understand that? So it's not that young. What keeps you in life is not what you have done, but what you still have to do, what you have not done. You yeah. not not have even starting to think about you know this is what is so this uh, voyage this um, journey was uh, was in some way also it was a visit because we really went to see it. Uh, carlos has been spending with me a lot of time to do this in new york uh, in, uh, in everywhere in london in paris everywhere really? in japan so I mean, it's, you, uh, it's, but it's you, really the same time as a meta metaphorical of course, and you and you fill it with these metaphors, which are quite interesting. And I made notes about them as I was reading. For instance, the calming of the waves with oil, these little droplets of oil. You talk it in a very engineering sense about <laughs> what happens. But there's also the metaphor of the little drops, each adding up, um, having having their having their outsized effects. And I, yeah. it's very, it's very to me. It seems very clear that you're talking about your own work and the way building by building, project by project, you try to, um, I think you cite Calvino as well, talking about the fragments in cities and how these little fragments are a seed, essentially uh, yeah. good. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, one of the most beautiful things about the book is this exploration of the way in which the process of architecture produces things which better or worse are part of a larger life project and part of a larger civil project. You, you seem to want to uh, always tie back your buildings to the, their meaning in the society where you make them and how they live don't just exist as objects. Yeah, that, that's what you dream your, all your life. I mean, I was born after the war. I I came from a family of builders, small builders. So I grew up on, uh, on the site. And watching at the mir miracle of making buildings. Making buildings is a miracle, Michael. It's a miracle. Right? In the yeah. morning, you have nothing there. And in the afternoon, you have something standing up. It's a miracle. For a little boy, six, seven, eight years old, it's a miracle. And then it's still a miracle for an old boy of 83 years. It's still yeah. the same miracle. So you go out with this idea, but also then you go to school, you go to university, and that was in Milan. In Milan in 63, 64, 1960, last century, it, it was the moment of first occupation of university, first rebellion. I was there. I was there in the night, sleeping in the, in, in, the, in the school. So you grow up with this idea that making building, making shelter for human being is a noble art mm -hmm. because you can change the world, because you can do something for people to stay together, to enjoy. Making shelter is good. That's a, the end of the job. And then you grow up and you start your life and then you, then you get, uh, you get the, the, 
the, the, the work to make a, a building in the center of Paris called Saint Beaubourg, and then was called Saint Pompidou. I was only 33 years old when, when, uh, and Carlo was what? Carlo was uh, probably five years old mm -hmm. when I got that job. And, and, and then you understand that making place for people, it's about um, the miracle of building, but it's also a miracle of making place where people stay together. Yeah. And people stay together, become better people. You yeah, know you that. say, in, interestingly about Bobo, you, you, I mean, you've obviously talked about this, and, and I should say to everyone here that this is one of the most personal and interesting sort of memoirs by an architect about each of their projects. But Bobo, you go back to, and you say that in some ways, if the building is imperfect, the thing that you are most proud of, the thing that you think makes that project is the square, um, is the public space that that building has created and how it has uh, changed that part of Paris. You, you're often turn, ret returning to this issue of the, the Agora in Athens or you know, in so many of your projects, the creation of, um, of a public space, not just a building. Absolutely. I'm, because I'm sure that public building doesn't matter if they are libraries or museum or concert hall or school, university, this is basically what I've done in my life. That this is basically what you, we see in Atlantis when we go around the world. Those buildings are about um, human life. So I'm, almost every time there's a piazza there because everything starts from a public space. Well, in New York, you know very well, the Whitney, we've been talking so many times about, the Whitney doesn't have that space. So what we, I did, what we did was lifting the building up like a vessel, so that the piazza become below the building. So that's where the piazza is. But you always need a place that is a public, and this is where the, meet, the building and the, and, the, and the town meet public space. Fundamentally, the problem is that, so the problem, the, 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 the real idea, and this is what comes out from the book, I think, from time to time, is that making good building is not about aesthetics, it's about ethics, it's about, it's the, that kind of beauty is not the, the frivolous beauty, it's not the visible part of the beauty, it's also the invisible part of beauty. And sometimes that's the reason why those buildings are so, I don't know how to say, some, sometimes a bit unpolite, sometimes a bit unexpected. But this is because those buildings are about something quite mysterious. And society is mysterious. Culture, are you defined culture? When, when you know, even, even take you with me, that is very, very recent. The Whitney is only a few years ago. Well, are you defined culture today? And now you define culture 50 years ago, in the 70s, at uh, the beginning of the 70s, only a few years after, after May 68 in Paris. How you define uh, culture? Uh, the culture with the small C, not the, the biggest C, the Dante one. It, uh, how you define? So you make buildings that inevitably celebrate that, that question, that uh, anxiety to understand what we are doing a place where people will meet for centuries because that's that's a funny thing you are not building for 10 years or 20 years but for uh, 500 years that's you, that by the way that's what we won the the competition for Bobo with Richard Rogers my friend and accomplice we went to see Monsieur Pompidou the, the president and he watched us and he said in good French, Vous comprenez? Can you understand, uh, Monsieur Piano and Monsieur Rogers? And that this building will last 500 years. 500 years. We, we watch each other with Richard. We never built at that time something lasting more than six months <laughs> uh, because we are young architects. <laughs> so, this idea that you make something that will last five centuries, maybe more than that. 
you are building something for the for the time where the function, even the school, university, library may change. You know, you have been to the library in the, at the Nyakas Foundation. You remember what? How you, how you define the library today? In the moment when everybody said book will disappear, I don't believe one second, by the way. I can see you have a lot of books in, in your place, of course. It's so okay. so it's, a funny, it's a funny mission. It's a funny job being an architect because you have to make an interpretation of those things and you have to transform this in the building. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the Whitney, which of course looks like a moored ship in many ways. And you, you obviously boats and ships and the sea have been such a, a formal part of your, your language too. Uh, my my favorite my my favorite my, my favorite project is Boburg. Is Boburg because uh, because all start from Boburg. Renzo Piano is Renzo Piano because there is Boburg. Racconta. Eh? <laughs> ah well, no, that was a funny story because we are young, but not stupid, and. Uh, uh, and that was very funny. Richard was Richard's been always uh, four years older than me, so that he was the good the good guy, the, the old guy. But we are bad boys, really impossible people. So the mayor of Paris, that was the prefet at that time, it was not the mayor. It was the rep representative of the of the government. The mayor uh, said, "You will never put those." Uh, um, element in the piazza. You remember those elements in the piazza that look like, like a ship, an underground ship coming up to breathe. Uh, he saw this, he said, take away, take away. And, and, we, and we went back and we said, okay, take away, but don't uh, throw away. I mean, we put in the, in the story. And then a few months later, we put back again. And he was, he was absolutely mad. He called us and said, you don't understand. You have to, to take away those things. You, it will be never more vivant than me, me living never, never. Three months ago, uh, later, the poor guy died. So that's <laughs> so we put back everything. You talk in the book also about, you know, you, you haven't forgotten the early hostility to the building. It wasn't that you forgot it, but, but that the opinions changed and that you learned a lot from that. Um, obviously, your life changed from Bobo, but also you learned a lot from that process, the reception of the, the building and, um, and how, you know, the building itself, even its reception has a, has a life, which, which uh, you know, can be very different from when it's young and, and when it's older. Bobo has now become you know, a monument in Paris. Um, and sometimes you also talk in the book about buildings that you've done, which you, it was interesting with a shard, for instance, I love and think it's a wonderful building. I was interested to see that you have, you know, you said it's just a little, I, I forgot the word, I can look it up. I don't want to put a word in your mouth about your own building, but you were sort of refreshingly, um, uh, you said it was a little too tame. Um, and Ooh. I think this is an interesting, it's like a relationship. I, I began to think that the way you talked about the buildings was a little like the relationship with your son, that you, they're, they're evolving, they're organic. Um, and so you look back on certain projects like that, uh, no, no, both, no. almost all of them, as if they're your, your children too, or something like this. Well, you, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I, I did confess something. You know, I was, I was, I was obliged because he actually, um, he actually stole from me things. And so, uh, talking about about the shard, and that was a great adventure, by the way. Yeah. And it was not a formal research at all, at all. It was really working with Ken Livingston about the idea to make it such a building. The mayor, the former mayor of London. The Ken Livingston was at that time the mayor. The idea to make a building like that, like a little vertical town with no car parking at all, just a few pieces, a few places. So it was, it was something, like that. but of course, when you finish, 
you look at that and you say, my God, I mean, me, maybe we should have been a bit more wild in some detail, you know, because when you make a building like that, it's a wonderful what you do inside. And what you do inside to all the building that fall is fantastic. And then there's one when all this disappear. And I like that from time to time, the muscles of the building come up. And in that building, it was a bit too, it probably we've been a bit too timid. Well, it's not a timid building at all, but you know, in some way you look at that, you are, you are, you are on a boat in the calm of the tropics and uh, you are drinking a little grappa and um, your son is there and he's, he's uh, torturing you. And, uh, and, then you, and then you tell the truth. So, and, and I did the same for other things and for many other things. I yes, said before, indeed. I said before, you, there's always something missing. Yeah. And yeah, this you, is what torture you. <laughs> it, it, anything creative is always the case. You, you, were, you had less than kind words to say about Lac LACMA, the road building there and, and the Potsdam plots. But this is life. We, we look back on what we do. So then, and you, that's an interesting metaphor you set up at the beginning with the sandcastle, that beautiful phrase you were uh, read before, you know, about don't look back. Um, this idea you build something and then you, you move on. Um, yeah. You had another story, actually, I really loved in the beginning of watching your father's car being hoisted um, onto a boat in Genoa, and that the mechanics of this, the sort of magic of seeing the underside of the car, and I guess yeah. you were describing there were also cows being hoisted and other things, that this whole, the levitation of this was nice. And of course, yeah, yeah. for anybody who knows your work, this idea of, of making things that feel light, making heavy things suddenly light, um, was unavoidable. Yeah, it's funny, it's funny. You are right, you are right, you are right. It's a, it's a constant uh, challenge with the force of gravity in some way, you know, and the fighting against the force of gravity is a nonsense, of course. You are lucky man yourself. You work with word and, and sound, music. When yeah. you play piano, that's light, fantastic. But try to do that with a piece of steel and concrete and all that. It's not that easy. So heaviness is part of, of, of the adventure in, in, in being a builder. Um, and, and, and so, and this, uh, and this uh, obsession for, about, about levitas, about lightness, I think it's probably coming from childhood, but you know, at a certain age you become romantic, so I don't want to be too much romantic, but I guess that being a child and going in the arbor at that time after the war in 56, 57, 50, you know, you know, in the arbor, everything flies, everything flies, even the boat that are like building fly, well, they don't fly, they float, but it's almost like flying, but everything else is flying. You have the cranes, even the car fly. You know, so this idea, and also the image fly, because you you have a, you have a, you have a you have a boat, and you have something lift up, and then you see in the water the reflection of that, so you see double. So everything is magic in the arbor. Everything is magic, and this magic comes from levitation, levitation from losing the the, the weight, fighting against gravity. And in some way, you keep the, you keep this for the rest of life. So I guess that the, the the attraction to this idea to make building like flying vessel is part of that. But it's not, Michael. It's not a stupid idea because when you make a building in a town in a city, it's not bad if the building fly because then you leave back to the city, all the land. So you have a, you're kind of inviting and making public building accessible, open yeah. and accessible is a fundamental thing. It's about well, openness, it's about- In the book, I, yeah, I mean, I would use, I would say more that you, not flying, but, but floating. There's a lot in the book, of course, about light and floating and the changing nature of the sea, which is, you know, something you describe in, we're talking about buildings like the one where I work or worked when we could get into the building where Carlo, you were an intern. I hadn't realized that you interned at the New York Times. 
in uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> for a little while. And, um, and there is about that building sort of uh, you, an attempt to create a kind of transparency, a lightness, an openness, which is, of course, you know, a, a metaphor of what a, a democratic free press uh, enterprise should be like. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, well, while I have you, because I don't, uh, we, we're running out a little time, but I did want to ask you, it's an interesting challenge to, I would imagine, to translate a book like this, because you do have essentially two very um, different voices, um, which you can't only convey by the, the, the bold face versus non-bold face type. Um, and, and Carl is a very beautiful writer, and Renz is a very sort of philosophical and interesting thinker about, uh, about architecture. But it's like translating two books simultaneously, I would imagine. I, maybe you could just speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it is. Um, um, I mean, you use the verb float, Michael, this notion of Renzo. Renzo does float on the page as well. And, and Carlo is, um, um, well, he's, he's every bit the journalist and that it's, it's grounded and it's, he provides, I guess, what you think of as the narrative scaffolding of, for the book, um, I mean, providing the book with anecdote. And um, um, I have to say, as a translator, it's, it's, it was, um, uh, it, it, it was quite rewarding because you, 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 um, you spend so much time with the book as a translator. Um, you read at a glacial pace, you know, I'm lucky if I get a page a day. And, and it starts to put pressure on a book, uh, uh, I think, to, you, 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 you hunger for um, event and action and, and be, because it, it's your own pace is so slow. And um, so just that sheer variety and having these two voices in the book was, was um, um, it was really a delight. You know, I was, I was um, translating probably about the last half of this while sheltering in place. Mm. And I could rely on, you know, that every time I sat down at my desk, thanks to this book, something new would, would sail across it. And uh, that was quite, uh, uh, so, so it's, um, yeah. It it's a, a great, it's a great book to read in these circumstances. I have to say to you, Renzo and Carlo, because it's, um, you know, it is a voyage. And first of all, it's, it's, there's a lot of vicarious pleasure in imagining myself on the boat crossing the Pacific or in the Mediterranean, the Adriatic, and you just, it's, it's an adventure. It's quite, it's quite wonderful. And Carlo, your descriptions of being on the water are, very vivid and, and, and often very poetic. So I also found it kind of liberating, um, especially in the beginning. It becomes more and more, Renzo, a kind of, um, a, a kind of uh, meditation on your, you know, on all these different projects which you arranged geographically. And you arrive back in, at the end in, in Athens. I suppose partly because of you're looking for Atlantis, but also I, th I think the building, the, the project, uh, the New Yorkers project in, in Athens for you sums a lot of things up um, formally and also in terms of its, its brief, its relationship to the sea. Maybe you could just, before we turn this over to questions, just describe what that project is for people who haven't seen it and, uh, and what it, it it means for you because I'm sorry but I will just set you up by saying so much of what you were talking about in the book is is a notion of the agora the the public square the the way in which you create this space that represents a kind of democratic idea yeah. and and obviously this is you're doing it now in in Athens so maybe you could describe a little why you ended the book there and what that project represents well, I, I think because it's about the Mediterranean Sea, you know, because it, it being born on the Mediterranean Sea, you know, when people ask me, 
Where are you from? Of course, I'm Italian. I was born in Italy. I'm a cosmopolitan. I live in Paris. I, as you know, I also live in New York from time to time and I, I go all around. But my answer is not really I'm Italian or European. My answer is more, in, is more I'm Mediterranean. I think the Mediterranean Sea as something special. All the sea has something special. But this sea is not even a sea in some way. It's like a soup of culture. It's a kind of a consomme of culture, the Mediterranean Sea. It's a full of voices, full of sound, full of, of, of a perfume. I mean, it's a, and, and the light, and the light of the Mediterranean Sea, and the, and the vibration of the surface. So in some way, Athens is a, is, is all this together. It's about the beauty of the breeze. And this is the reason why that funny flying carpet on the top, because it's a capturing the energy from the sun that is part of our modern time. And eh? in some way today, it's not just today, since now a few decades, it's clear enough that the earth is fragile and the world is fragile, and so we have to address that point. So why we don't capture the energy from the sun? So that funny thing up there. So let, let me just interrupt you, Kate, for people who don't know what, what you, you're referring to here. So this is a cultural center <clears throat> in which you created, essentially much of the, the project is, as it were, buried under a hill, a, a, a park, which you've created. And then on top of the building, where it's not a park, it, are these photovoltaic panels, solar panels, a football field size? Uh, yes, yes, it's very, yeah, and, it's very um, and to capture the the Mediterranean sun. So in a way, the building itself is uh, is, and then all, everything surrounding a public a square. It's about it's, you also go up on the roof because you also can go into the park and look out over the sea. So that's why I sort yeah, of absolutely, absolutely. You know, Athens is very low, it's a low city. So if you go up a 30 meter, that is under feet, is not too much, but it's enough to rediscover the entire city. So what we've done, because we've got a big, big site, we made the, the park and the slope, but it's only a 6% slope, so we can walk. So when you walk in the park, you go up. We don't even notice, you know, if you go up in the park, at a certain moment, you turn your head and you realize that you're being up 30 meters in there. And suddenly you discover Athens. And when you go and you look south, you discover the sea. So this idea of a mixing, the nature of the park, the park is actually a very Mediterranean park. The breeze, uh, well, Athens is a very breezy city. Mm. You know, the breeze goes up very quickly, especially the, with the mountain, it goes up to 40 knots. So the idea to create, but also in a very, it, it's, a, it's a, the light is, a, is very strong. You, it's it's a so strong that you need in the summer, especially in the summer, something to give you a shadow. So it's, it was a combination of many things, nature, a breeze, a light, a sun, energy. And when you put everything together in the spirit of a place, Athens, that is in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. That is a magic for me, it's magic. And it's something that you bring with you. You bring with you probably all your life together, the vibration of the light, the color, and, and also together with the voices. Because the, 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 the and, 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 and together with the magic of the arbor, of the floating um, uh, building, the, the boat, the, the ship. So all this is part of what you, I, I get you call this the roots, the roots. And, but I know that the roots can be a trap. I'm not that stupid. So yeah, that, that, there's, a, there's a something you can build on your own roots, castle of rhetoric, you know, so you have to be careful. But those are poetic poetical roots. So it's, it's, it's a rhetoric free. I hear you. The book is, <laughs> goes back to the roots of Plato, but I, I, I know what you're saying. You can't get tied down. You have to float above your, uh, <laughs> your own metaphor. <laughs> hey, Mike, I should turn over to you in case there are people want to ask some questions. Maybe you want to oversee that? 
Yeah, I think without uh, going too much over time, we, we probably have enough time for a couple of questions. And, and before that, thank you very much for this wonderful conversation, Michael Carlo and uh, Renzo. Uh, first of all, very importantly, I think there's been a great deal of controversy in the chat about the word Mugugno, Mugugnare. Is it Genovese? Is it Genovese or is it Italian? And I, we need to sort that out before we move ahead. <laughs> I think I think it's Genovese, but uh, is also Italian, but come from Genoa, Mugugno, Mugugno, Mugugno. but it's also it's in Genoa. Italian. Okay, <laughs> so it's an export from Genoa, Italian, so. <laughs> the rest of Italy. Um, and Renzo Piano, about the the search for beauty that is in the subtitle of this book. From your perspective, in your opinion, is that, in your experience, is that search for beauty a creative act? Is that an act of creation or is it more a contemplative exercise? Well, it's a it's, discussion about beauty is so complex. You know, beauty is not, it's not frivolous idea, beauty. I mean, it's, a, it's a so fundamental. I mean, even even the word bello, bello in Italian, it doesn't just mean beautiful, it's also good. And of course, the kalos of the Greek is not just a beautiful, it's also good. There are many languages, but even in English, when you say a, 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 a beautiful person, a beautiful mind, it's not applicable to the visible world, the word beauty. Beauty is also applicable to the invisible world. Is something that can apply to solidarity, human solidarity. Is apply, you, know, is a, you can apply beauty to to the human curiosity, science. I've been working so many times with scientists. They are incredible people. That that's what they, they look for. So in some way, if you if this is beauty, then everybody everybody is looking for beauty for for a, a kind of beauty, and in some way making building for for that kind of beauty, uh, for cultural beauty, for artistic beauty, for research beauty, for education, for, for, for that kind of beauty is, is fundamental. Everybody knows about the famous word of the prince uh, uh, Miskin in the, in the idiot of Dostoevsky saying, saying beauty will save the world. Well, but the beauty in Russia means exactly not just the beautiful, but also good. And of course, I'm not sure beauty will save the world, but certainly will save a lot of people, a lot of people. Because if you if you if you try if you if you get in touch with that sort of beauty, because you become a curious person, that's why making building public building for research, for education, for culture, for music, for, for all this is, is important because you make a place where people become a better people. A, a people, a better people make a better cities to live and to stay together. So in, in some way this, if you, if you conceive beauty in that sense, then you are not ashamed to talk about. Otherwise, you feel, you feel like a bit stupid talking about beauty. The world has a big problem and you talk about beauty. Well, but if you understand that beauty is not that surface, it's not something on surface, it's something very deep, it's about desires. And you know, at the end, architecture is not just about need and, and necessity, but it's also about desires. That, that's what you have to, to do. So, and that's the reason why beauty comes on surface on the book from time to time, because it's that sort of beauty. I, I, I cannot imagine a better way to conclude this conversation. Um, so Renzo Piano and Carlo Piano, thank you so much. Specifically, thank you for this wonderful book. Uh, and thank you, Will Schutt, for this wonderful book and, and your beautiful translation. Michael, a, a tremendous conversation. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us. And um, let's go out and find something beautiful together. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ciao.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sir Carlos. Thank you. Ciao, Michael. Bye-bye. Ciao. Ciao, grazie. Thank you.